Please turn with me once again to the book of the prophet Malachi. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2, <clears throat> reading the first nine verses. And now, O priests, this commandment is for you. And if you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your solemn feasts, and one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge and people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. A society can only really be one after God's own heart when God's word, God's character, and God's reality are taken seriously. If a society does not take God seriously, if a society dismisses him as fantasy, dismisses him as old-fashioned, or thinks that even though he might be real, there is nothing that we can pin down objectively about him, when society starts to think that way, how can we ever expect that society to live righteously or to pass just laws or to respect and value people of all uh, uh, viewpoints and nationalities and backgrounds? If a society does not have God Almighty as its foundation, and a society does not look to pursue what he deems is right and what he deems is holy and just and good, how can that society ever hold together? And in a way, you're seeing the Lord warning Israel about that. And in a way, we can look around in our own society and see some of the where the, the crumbling is coming, where God is not highly sought and not highly thought after. The prophet here is warning the priests. He's warning the priests of the nation who had the charge of keeping the, uh, the worship and the temple system intact. Uh, just remember again, this is a group of people who are now returned from captivity in Babylon. They have reestablished a temple sacrificial system. This is a group of people whose ancestors were very zealous to be back in the land. And now we're a couple of generations removed from those people who returned, and their children don't remember, and their children don't care all that much, and their children are not all that passionate. And yet the priests are the ones who are supposed to be the most passionate, the most careful, the most uh, tedious in their way of keeping things exactly as God would have them. And yet he calls them out and he says, you know, you priests, you've fallen into the same problem of the society as a whole. You have lost your experiential faith. You are going through the motions. You have encompassed something of a dead orthodoxy in your belief. 
and there is no heart after me. And without a heart after me, how can you ever seek to accomplish what I have desired for you, what I have desired for my people, and what I have desired you to see in your glorious joy in the coming Messiah and the salvation that alone comes through him? The people are following your example, O priests, and you, as the, the, the ones who hold up this earthly representation of God on earth, are going to be most responsible when you, when you push people away from the truth of God by your own example and by your own being. And churches today very often are empty of, God, of a seriousness in God and a seriousness of calling God's people to be what he would have them to be, and a seriousness in calling God's people to what the scripture says about life and about worship and about the heart and about mentality. And if the churches are spiritually blind themselves, how can they ever be guides to the rest of the world and to those who are spiritually blind? We have in Romans the call where the Jews thought themselves as the guides of the blind, and the light to the world. Well, the true Christians are that. Christ says not to hide the lamp under a bushel, but to be those blind, th that light. But the Christian must so make sure that his light is shining purely and in accordance with what God would have them be. And this passage shows us the seriousness of God in his ordinances towards his people, in his commands for his people, in what he set up and what he has called them to do. If you didn't think he was serious when, when he put you in exile, Israel, I hope you understand the seriousness now, because Malachi, burdened with this task of prophesying, burdened with this task of giving out uh, this, this warning, is also burdened with the task of speaking in very strong language, using very strong imagery. And any intelligent reading of the Bible will tell you that our God is a very serious God. He uses strong language. He uses heavy metaphors. He uses vivid images and descriptions. He uses parables that, that give us a grasp of where things come and lead and how things end. Uh, and I will admit that there are passages in the scripture that I myself often feel intimidated to teach and preach on. I shouldn't be so. I'm ashamed of that. But there are passages even in the New Testament where God's seriousness and God's authority come out in such a way that me being a 21st century person in America sometimes looks at that and goes, how would I present that? But here we have Malachi holding nothing back. And we have Malachi saying, look, this is what the Lord told me and this is what he is going to do. And this passage, though it's weighty, though it's heavy, Though there are aspects of it where we might cringe a little bit, especially at the beginning, we have to take this passage and understand what God is saying in the context that he's saying it, how we are to understand it, and then not only how we are to understand it, but how we are to embrace and apply it even to our situation here. There is, this, there is a principle and an understanding that everything that God has said and everything that God has written in the word of God, which is his, full, his complete revelation given to us, must be embraced. When we come upon difficulty, we have to understand the context, the application, and the meaning. Um, when, we, when I plug in a psalm to sing, uh, there are times when I read through the words of the psalms, and, and, and some of them, it's like, oof, same thing as, do I really want to preach on this? Is, will people understand what we're singing here? Because there are some things in the Psalms that are also very weighty. And yet we are called to understand what they're saying, to understand what God is saying, and then embrace it. The same seriousness abounds in the New Testament as in the Old Testament. The same seriousness of the care for souls, of the care for God's kingdom, of the care for the righteousness and upholding of his name, of the care that the fact of God would be central and God would be glorified and God would be honored in all things. That seriousness is throughout New Testament, Old Testament, Psalms, Proverbs, Genesis, Revelation, God has said, I am that I am. I will be your God and you shall be my people. And so what God says is meant for him to be embraced as we glory in him. When sin is condemned, God has the glory. 
And when sin is condemned, even in strong terms, we need to understand and embrace God's message and God's communication. Now that being said, let's look at these verses and let's understand what exactly he's saying. He says, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. Now let's understand what a biblical curse is. Uh, we sometimes think of curses in terms of Walt Disney cartoons. A curse came upon the castle and the vines overgrew it and, and all of that stuff. Or we might think of old world curses uh, like the, remember the movie Moonstruck? There's the little old lady in the airport who says, I put a curse on that plane. And you have the old Italian ladies cursing people. This is not the same thing. It's not to be taken lightly. Uh, it's not something that's just fanciful. It's not something that comes with witchcraft. When God puts a curse upon something, he is really, he's really saying that you are getting justice for your actions. You are getting what you deserve for your disobedience. We remember, we talk about the curse that come upon mankind with the fall of Adam and Eve. Well, that's a curse. The whole earth is cursed because of what our ancestors did. Well, we look at that and, you know, there might be some attributes that seem almost where fantasy has drawn from them, but what is essentially happening? Sin has its consequences. And so here he says, you, O priests, I put a curse on you because though you know better, though you've studied better, though you observed and learned from your grandparents who also worshipped better, you have not taken part in what you knew to be right. And so a curse will come upon you. And when God puts a curse on someone or something, you can be sure they deserve it. Doesn't happen lightly, doesn't happen, happen with triviality, and doesn't happen in a way that is flippant or just to be laughed off and, and moved on to something else the next time. And as if the, the cursing and as if the weight of that was not enough, he then has to bring in a type of imagery that is just very graphic. Um, he says, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces. Uh, now let's, you know, that's a nice way that this translation has polished that. But if you've got an ESV or a King James, it just says dung. I'll spread dung on your faces. He's essentially saying, what you are doing before me in your worship services, in your sacrificial meals, in the way you are going about uh, practicing what I have commanded, is as good as if it were refuse. That's what it is to me. Because your heart is not in it. You are not sacrificing, as we saw in the previous chapter, the best. And you are not giving of yourselves entirely to it. And so what it is, is a stench in my nostrils and something that is foul and disgusting because you are not putting me first. And so God uses that imagery to make it very plain to these people, to make it very plain to this nation that he wasn't kidding around with captivity and he's not kidding around now and they need to be faithful to who he is, to what his covenant is. And the form of devotion that they put on, the veneer that they put on without the heart is just garbage. And he says, you deserve to wear your religion on you in this form. Your religion deserves to be worn for everyone to see so that they know that your hearts are empty and I am not in that heart. Empty religion today. Churches that use God's name but don't honor and glorify his name. Uh, people who profess to believe or who want to, to, to be devoted to God who have no heart in Christ, the same concept applies. People who put on a great spectacle or a great show, but don't love with passion the word of God and the truth of that word and the glory of the gospel, the same imagery applies. The same application stands. God cares about his name and about his people and about his children and about the devotion to him. And may we never look at scripture and say, we have the freedom to do what we want with it. Because nothing in scripture backs that concept up. 
His holy and glorious name are at the center of what he's looking for here. His holy and glorious name, take it to heart, give glory to my name, live in the passion of God. Much of what was said last week in the sermon still applies here. He's saying, you have to know me, you have to love me, you have to live me, you have to follow after me, you have to walk with me, you have to, to have a need for me. Don't just let this become some empty shell to prevent you from falling into judgment and captivity again. Don't get so caught up in an understanding that you're a political entity and you need to have uh, a freedom and, and release from your political bondage, whether it comes from the Romans in the future or whether it comes from the Greeks in the future. Don't view yourselves that way. View yourselves as a people that is connected to a holy and righteous God, a people who are connected in covenantal way, a people who are so dependent on the ability and action and fulfillment of God's truth and God's coming Messiah and God's coming sacrifice that will forgive all and establish his kingdom so heavily reliant on that that you cannot go to the temple without a great sense of the importance of it, without a great sense of the glory of it and the passion of it. And so when we gather together on Sunday and we worship our Lord, we pray and we hope that the Holy Spirit is also with us to the extent that we look at what we're doing and we don't just go, here it is again, another Sunday, another time, another hymn, another prayer, another scripture reading, but we understand that we are encountering our Lord here. We are experiencing him as we hear the word read, as we hear it proclaimed, as we hear it applied. He is among us and he is working to draw us to himself. He is working to build up his kingdom and that's a great and glorious thing. And so may his holy and glorious name reign supreme even here. And may we not fall into the trap of these priests and be pulled down by redundancy and by boredom and by tradition. But may our faith be alive and powerful and bright as any shining light can be. He goes on after he makes this, he describes this curse and after he, he gives this curse and he says, look, he says, then you shall know uh, that I have sent this commandment to you that my covenant with Levi may continue. A curse will come upon you, O priests, but the priesthood is not done yet, because my covenant with Levi is to continue. And so now he goes on and uses an illustration of the proper heart and glory of what the priest is to be. He uses an illustration, he takes the historical example of, of what the character of the Levit Levitical priesthood was meant to be, and he uses that as a type and shadow of who Christ really is. You remember that, uh, if you remember from reading Hebrews, we're told that we have a great high priest, not after the order of Levi, but after the order of Melchizedek, who's an entirely different priesthood. Nonetheless, Every understanding of priests and of the sacrificial system and of all that came before Christ was meant to point to him, was meant to be a type and shadow of the sacrificial system that would be fulfilled in him on the cross and all that he accomplished. So even though we're not talking about Melchizedek and we're talking about Levi and we're talking about the Levitical priesthood, there is this sense in which the good examples and the hearts of faith, the heart of faith that's being described here, remember Levi was a human being too. Levi was, uh, was sinful as well. He wasn't perfect, but the good example of Levi, the good example that's being brought up here, the perfection of that, the wholeness of that would only be fulfilled in the Savior, in the Messiah Christ Jesus. And so this covenant of Levi, these priests may, may refuse in Malachi's day or may be uh, unwilling to have a heart full of grace and the glory of God's name in Malachi's day. But the day has not arrived for the whole priesthood to be put to death. Reform will come. Reform needs to be come to the order. And a reform that harkens back to the idea and understanding of the first one with an idea and understanding of Christ as the fulfillment and the perfect and the perfect priest. He says this covenant that was with Levi was one of life and peace. This covenant was one that encompasses entirely the nature of God's character and of godliness itself. Um, reform needs to come so that it goes back to a devotion 
and a heart after God. When we say we're reformed and we speak as the reformed view or the reformed church, I always don't get the wrong picture in your mind of what that means. That does not mean European. That does not mean uh, 15th, 16th, 17th century European. That means back to God. That means biblical. So when someone says, well, they're, they're truly reformed, that's not a bad term. What it really means is truly biblical. Our desire is to be as biblical as possible. And we always want to be examining ourselves and comparing ourselves with what God has said and what we are supposed to be. And so the reform that is being called for is to come back to what God's intentions were for this priesthood. Back to what God's intentions were. And he uses the illustration here with Levi. It's meant to picture the future high priest. The descriptives, the, des the description of the perfect priesthood were never attainable by any man, but are still to be seen among those who are guides to the spiritually blind, the priesthood here in Malachi's day. And what are those descriptives? What are those characteristics? He says, he says, his covenant was one of life and peace. The character of God, the character of godliness. Says, he feared me. Now we know that that was a reverential fear. A fear as one looks to their father. A fear of devotion and love. But there was also a sense of fear of this almighty God. Yeah, you know that he's your father. You know that he loves you. You know that he's with you. But there is also a fear that you don't want to displease him. You don't want to fall under any type of chastisement or any type of, uh, of paining or grieving of the Holy Spirit or grieving of our God. And so the true priest fears God. It says he was reverent before my name. There's a comparison. The false priests, the, the, the empty priests were not reverent before their name. They were not glorifying his name. They were offending his name. And the true priest does not do that. He says, injustice was not found in his lips. Here you have an institution that is to be held up as an example to the nation. And injustice and corruption have filtered through just as they had in previous years. We'll be saying the true priesthood and the, the picture I'm use, he's using here with Levi, the true priesthood, injustice was not found there. We talk a lot about justice in our society today. And the, some have made the argument that no one really has a grasp of what justice really is. And they don't know what they're talking about. God knows what true injustice is. God knows what true justice is. And you can be sure that when he says about a true priest, a true priesthood, a true glorious, glorious Messiah, that injustice was not found on his lips. Injustice would not be among him. That you can be sure everything that is righteous and good and upright and whole and, and, and wonderful and warm and safe could be found in the ideal priest, the ideal priesthood. And it certainly is found in our Lord Jesus. It says, he walked with me in peace and equity. The true priest, the ideal priest, walks with God. There's a connection there. There's a fellowship there. There's a communion there. There's a closeness there. There's an intimacy there. And it says, the true priest turned many away from iniquity. How do you turn someone away from iniquity? Only God can really, truly, truly change a person's heart. But by God's grace, we are, we are given the ability to direct people towards his example. We are given the ability in our fallen and incomplete way to exemplify him. And by our example, by our words, by our direction, by our love, by our care, by our showing and proclaiming of what is right, by our doing justice and loving mercy and walking humbly with our God, we, like the ideal priest, can have a hand in turning people away from iniquity. We may not be able to save their soul. God does that. But we can possibly put them in the right direction. We can point them towards righteousness. We can point them towards his glory. We can uphold his name. And so a true priest turns many away from iniquity. And certainly in fulfillment, our Lord Jesus has done that. It's a wonderful picture. It's a glorious picture. And so we look at that as the example we look at that and see that the priesthood in this day was not following that example. And then we look at that and say, are we? 
are these characteristics found among us in our church as God's people, as God's representatives. And when we see people who fail to meet these expectations, or, or these, these characteristics, I should say, when we see people who fail this, when we are perhaps in the situation where we're observing a priesthood more like the first couple verses, a priesthood that does not glory in God's name, that does not delight in him, when we see God's representatives fail, it's important for us to also remember to have the proper biblical response. Only Christ is perfect. Only the fulfilled priesthood is perfect. God's standards are there to direct us and everyone else to him. When we understand we're not perfect, we lean and rely all the more on him for forgiveness and righteousness and for direction. When his representatives mess up, when his representatives mess up, it does not reflect on God. His word is fixed. His moral law is fixed. His statutes and his righteousness and his justice and his purity, that's fixed. That doesn't change. And so when his representatives mess up, it doesn't reflect on him. And if you see a leader in a church or a spiritual guide of some sort really mess up and fall, always remember that you're not to give up on God because of that person. God's word is there for all of us, and we're all accountable to it. And you will be disappointed by, by someone sometime. If I haven't disappointed you yet, I will disappoint you in something. You can be assured of that. But don't let that ever draw, drive you away from God. For God is the authority. Hypocrisy is not a life of struggle and repentance. That's not hypocrisy. When Christians mess up and sin and are repentant and sorrowful for their sin, that is not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is bold, unapologetic pride that you're not wrong. You might condemn somebody else, but you see righteousness in yourself. You're keeping your, you're keeping your faith in yourself that way, whereas the true Christian keeps his faith in the living and objective God, and may we do that as well. He goes on, and he finishes, and he says, For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. He is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. So we look at this and we say, okay, I see him talking a lot about an Old Testament priesthood here. And, and maybe I can make the jump somehow. How is this really supposed to be applied to me? Doesn't this just fit into this context, this time, this group of people? How do I apply this to myself? Well, let's remember that when we speak about the priesthood of all believers in our New Testament covenantal context, let's remember that we ourselves have been made priests and kings to God. The old process is passed away. The old sacrificial system, the temple has been destroyed. That's all gone and done away with. And when we read in, in Peter that, he, that we've been made priests and kings to God, we take that to heart. When we read in the book of the Revelation, chapter 5, uh, where, the, where the song, the new song is sung, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. There is the sense in which, because in this new covenant context, with Christ as the great high priest and mediator, we have access to God through him, so that we are all priests. When we see a passage directed to priests, for the lips of a priest should, speak, should keep knowledge and people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord's hosts. If you want to, to, to make application of that, let's all remember that we have a part to play in this as well. And as kings and priests to God, we are to see ourselves as a type of the modern priesthood in walking just, in, in, in following these examples of verse 6, and walking justly and humbly before our God. 
Our directive as, God pre as God's priests is, this is what you are to be and do, my children. I shall be my, your God and you shall be my people and you shall be a light unto the world and you shall be a glorious and graceful and wonderful group of people. Oh, sin will still be among you for now and I'm working to sanctify you, but I will come back and, and, and rid you of all of that with my fulfilled kingdom. But for now, live and walk with me. Rely on me. Live humbly. Walk justly with me. Uphold me and love me and follow me and obey me and honor me in all things. And you will find the rest and the peace and the salvation and the eternity and the life that comes coursing from an almighty and virtuous and perfect wonderful God. We are, we are a group that effects an eternal realm. Back to that passage in Revelation chapter 5, if you look a little bit before us, this is the scene in heaven. Verse 8, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now even with that picture, of the prayers of the saints being bowls of incense filling the heavenly realm. That gives us a great impression of what our prayer life, what our activity, what even our testimony has effect on even in, hev in the heavenly realm. If when we gather together on Sunday or on Tuesday or among our smaller groups or among our friends and we pray together or if we pray ourselves alone in our room, do you picture it as something that comes into heaven and is delightful to God? Do you understand? We don't understand the mystery of why prayer is effective. We know that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, uh, and we know that everything is in his, his providence before the foundation of the world. Yet he tells us to pray, and we find that prayer works. There's mystery in that. There's mystery that no theologian really fully grasps or put their, puts their finger on. But I believe the Scripture teaches us that as kings and priests to God who gather together, who pray together, there is an eternal effect that that has. There is a heavenly effect that that has. There is a glorious there is a glorious worship of God's name that, 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 that has. And when we come together and do this, let's understand how sacred that is. Let's understand how precious that is. And let's understand that it's not just something to do or something to cast aside or something that is trite or trivial. The prayers of the saints have a wonderful testimony and a wonderful effect. And a priest's lips should keep knowledge and the people should seek law from his mouth for he is the messenger of the law of, of the of the lord of hosts and so as kings and priests to god may our light shine before all this is something echoed in the gospels something echoed here something echoed through all the pages of scripture you shall be my people a city set upon a hill so that the world will see you and understand that you are not of this world that you are not of mortality that you are not of the system of money and commerce alone. That you are not of the system of political power, of political ease, and political clout. But you are of a system that is coming. You are of a system that is eternal. You are of a great king, a glorious savior, a mighty messiah. And as you speak, as you love, as you live, as you walk, as you work, as you indwell, and as you proclaim, and as you act as example all around, you will be a light that shines before all. It's a wonderful thing. It's a sobering thing. Our God's a serious God, but he's a seriously loving God to his people. And he's a seriously gracious and merciful God to all those who rely on him. We, we are guides to the spiritually blind. We are the kings and priests to God. And this priesthood of a bad example is set up to show us what the good example is in Christ and to walk with him and to live in him and to glorify his name and to shine that glory everywhere we go. May Grace Church do this by God's power and may we rest in that great truth and that great ability. Let's pray. Our dear, gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, your strong language shakes us 
and calls us to attention at how you take your name and your worship very seriously. But it also shakes us and calls us to attention that we have a great high priest. We have a great mediator. We have a great and loving Heavenly Father that we are, that we have access to through that high priest and mediator. We have an eternal family in the heavens. We have an eternal home in the heavens, a house not made with hands. Uh, we have a glorious future because of what Christ has done. And with an understanding of that future, with an understanding of the peace of that future, may we be a, a positive priesthood even in our time. May we be a good and holy example of who our Savior is to the best of our ability. And may we honor you in all that we say and do. And may we worship you with a passion and a truth that can only come from you, but is delightful to you. We want to love you and serve you and delight in you. We want to fear you, but we also want to, to understand your great closeness and your great providence and care for us. May, may you draw near as we draw near to you. Fill us all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.